Exploding planes, destructive computer devices, agents with families, an international spy team, plot twists, and more make up the first spy movie released in 2022, The 355. Hi, this is Tom Pizzotto from SpyMovieNavigator.com. Join us as we're cracking the code of the just released The 355. As usual, with these quick fires, we won't be giving any spoilers in this review. Now, given the number of times we've seen the trailer for this movie at every movie we've been to recently, if you don't think talking a little bit about the plot is a spoiler, we won't give away any of the twists. Now, initial reviews for this movie have been all over the place. We liked it. Audiences appear to like it, but the critics really didn't. But that's okay. That's fairly common. We think it's fairly predictable, which is one of the problems the critics have with it. But we think it's still an enjoyable movie. At its core, this is a spy movie headed by a team of international spies who are all women. And we had trepidation before going to this because the last one of these spy movies that was marketed as a team of women spies that we went to was that 2019 abomination, Charlie's Angels. We really hated that one. Fortunately, we have a different reaction to the 355. In the 355, yes, they're all women agents, but it isn't the sole focus of the team as it appeared to be in Charlie's Angels. Here, they're international agents trying to stop a bad thing from happening, and their mission is the main focus. There's less of that girl power, glam type stuff in the 355, which we actually appreciate here. That's not to say there aren't situations that these women deal with that are in the movie because they're women. It's just not overplayed in our opinion. Now, Jessica Chastain plays a CIA agent, Mason Brown, who's called Mace throughout the movie. Without giving away how it got there, she ends up teaming with a team of international agents. They need to track down a device that can be used to cause major havoc and destruction across the world. Sounds like a spy movie to me. She connects with German agent Marie Schmidt, played wonderfully by Diane Kruger, who's almost a reluctant spy for this mission. Penelope Cruz plays Graziella, who's not an operative. She's a Columbia agency therapist who happens into the situation. She's a very reluctant spy. Lupita Nyong'o plays Kaja, who's from MI6, but appears to have retired. Her role is similar to Ben Wishaw's Q in the Daniel Craig Bond movies, or Luther or Benji in the Mission Impossible movies. She's the technical geek who has an amazing ability to hack into any system. And, of course, she's got the comm systems that they're all wearing so they can all communicate with each other flawlessly. We've talked about the use of reluctant spies in many of our podcast episodes discussing other spy movies. We think it adds a bit of tension to the plot, and we like it. So, those are the four key women agents, three of which are reluctant to some degree. All four of them are played by very talented actresses, two of whom have won Best Performance by an Actress in a Supporting Role Academy Awards. Sebastian Stan plays Nick Fowler, who's a colleague of Mace's in the CIA. There's more there, but we're not going to give anything away there. John Douglas Thompson plays Larry Marks, who is Mace's boss. He's kind of got a role similar to M in the Bond movies, Ross in the Harry Palmer movies, or Hunley in the Mission Impossible movies. Finally, there is Bing Bing Fan, who plays Lin Mi Shang. We're not going to give away her role in the movie. All we can say is she was excellent in this role, and her role added some good depth to the movie. She first appears later in the movie, and things pick up when she arrives on the screen. Now, except for a female newscaster, all of the other credited roles were male. So this woman spy movie thing, it wasn't just a girl power movie. There were a lot of men roles in this movie. As we said, we're not going to give away any spoilers, but we want to talk a little bit about the action and the feel of this movie. To us, it felt like it wasn't trying to be a big action movie like Mission Impossible or the recent James Bonds. A lot of the action is done through chase scenes with people running or occasionally on a motorcycle. There's a lot of hand-to-hand combat, and the big guns don't come out until later in the movie. Therefore, it seemed more realistic and less fantastical than those other movies. We like this approach. There was no need to crash five $400,000 cars, yet there was enough action in this movie. We think this movie had a decent flow to it and it's well acted. We also like the type of action scenes they had. That said, there are four parts of this movie that we think could have been better, and three of them are related. The first is the writing. The story isn't just that imaginative. It's a fairly straightforward plot with twists that are sometimes predictable, especially if you pay attention to how far along in the movie something happens. However, it kept us engaged, which is the important part. We liked it. The second area that could have had some improvement is the character development for everybody not named Mace. We think there are two reasons that this development wasn't there. And the first was the writing in general wasn't as strong as we would have liked. But the second is there are too many of what we'll call subleads in this movie to get the backstory in depth on each of those characters. 
you get more character development with Mace and Marie than with Graziella, Kaja, or Lin Mi Shang. And we really wanted Lin Mi Shang's character to have more development. She was a great character. We really liked her. At the end, they sort of hint that there could be a sequel to this. So hopefully they'll be able to flush out some of these characters more if there are sequels to it. In general, we like Tim Maurice Jones's cinematography. However, one thing he did wasn't to our liking. Many of the action sequences, especially the hand-to-hand fights, were filmed with a very shaky style, a very shaky camera. Steady cam was not used. <laughs> Think of the Blair Witch Project, but shakier. To us, this was a distraction, though. It was definitely a style choice. Didn't work for me, but we're sure others saw this and said, wow, they got that right. They really showed the action. So it's a style choice. You've got to let them have that, just not one that we liked. Now, the fourth thing, the last thing that I really would have liked to have seen different is I didn't like the character Mace. That's a problem when she's the lead character and the one who drives the mission. I mean, it's just I didn't like her character in general as a person. She's also the character that's most flushed out, so we can see there's more of her character that we don't like. Jessica Chastain plays Mace well, so it wasn't her performance. It was just the character as written that I didn't like. For us, Marie and Lin Ming Shang are the reasons we really liked the 355. Marie had some depth to her character, and it is a role very well suited for Diane Kruger. Now that said, we've heard Marianne Cotillard was supposed to play this role originally. We don't know what happened, but we like Kruger as Marie a lot. So we're glad that happened, although we don't know what Marianne would have done with it. Graziella and Kaja were well acted, but they were almost cliche characters. You had Graziella, who was this very reluctant spy because she really wasn't a spy, and she was also a mother. And you had Kaja doing the tech geek role. So they were kind of cliche. Kaja's role was very needed for this. I'm not sure that Graziella's was, but Kaja was definitely needed to be there because you needed the tech person with the way this movie goes. So these agents have to track down the device we mentioned earlier, and they run into some roadblocks, some of which are predictable. The action scenes are well done. Not over the top, we talked about the cinematography on those, but we thought that the 355 is a fun watch. Now, one of our goals here at the Spy Movie Navigator is to point out how one movie scene was influenced by, or maybe influenced a scene from a different movie, or from real-life events. And the 355 leans on some tropes of other movies in telling its stories. We're going to start with the opening shot. I mean, the first seconds of the movie. It's an overhead shot looking down on top of some trees like it might have been shot from a drone. We don't know what it was about the year 2019, but this is the third spy movie we've seen that was filmed in 2019 that starts with the same shot. Cliff Walkers and No Time to Die are the other two. We don't get it, but sometimes these coincidences just happen. For instance, we just wrapped up our podcast episodes on the Kingsman movies and commented how in 2017, three different movies used the John Denver song Take Me Home Country Roads. Sometimes it just goes that way, I guess. Now, the Melissa McCarthy movie Spy has a large influence on a key part of this movie. We're not going to tell you where, as that would be a spoiler, but if you've seen Spy, and you should if you haven't, you'll know what we're talking about when you see it. Another scene in the 355 seems to be a blend of the auction scene in the James Bond movie Octopussy and the charity TV drive with Professor Joe Butcher from License to Kill. We like how they did that in this scene. Another small little callback here is a a line that was said in the opening scene where they say, let's do business. This immediately made us think of the Godfather or Scarface, the phrase itself, not the scene. There are a few callbacks to the Bourne movies as well. For instance, Mace opens up a drawer that has multiple passports. We saw that in Bourne where he goes into the safe deposit box and has multiple passports. In our podcast with the real CIA operative, Andrew Bustamante, he told us that CIA agents would have multiple passports. So not only was this scene a callback to the Bourne identity, but to the real world as well. And there are other callbacks to Bourne as well, so we can see that that movie does have an influence on the 355. Anybody need a pair of glasses? In keeping with Mission Impossible Spy in the first two Kingsman movies, glasses can be more than just glasses, as they are here in the 355. Then there's a trope that's used in so many spy movies that it's tough to call out one of them. Mace is told she can't officially stay involved with the case, but she's told that unofficially her boss would like her to go rogue on this one. Hmm, a rogue agent. Yeah, not very unique. However, what she ends up doing by being rogue lets the international team of spies get built. There's also a call out to a very intense scene in Mission Impossible 3 that has Ethan, Julia, and Owen Davian in it. 
We don't want to say any more about it, but we think that scene influenced a scene towards the end of the 355. And finally, there's a foot chase that seems like a smaller version of the chase after the title sequence in Casino Royale. It's the scene where Bond is chasing Maloka through the construction site. Here, there's a big chase, and it's through a fish market. There's a lot of climbing up and down and jumping and stuff, just like they did in Casino Royale. Now, another part of the movie that we liked was how native languages were used and subtitled. Each of these spies comes from a different country, and there are scenes where they have conversations with people from their country. Many of those conversations are spoken in the native language and subtitled in English. We thought this was a great touch for here in the U.S., and it would be very easy to change the subtitles to a different language for a different location. Now, this subtitles is in stark contrast to what Steven Spielberg did in his 2021 release of the movie West Side Story. In that movie, the Puerto Rican characters have dialogue in Spanish. Spielberg has said he thought it would be disrespectful to use English subtitles. I mean, what does he know? He's only had 17 Academy Award nominations and won three of them. But regardless of that, we think he's wrong here. We thought it was a problem for West Side Story, and we appreciate the subtitles in the 355. We think it shows respect for the native language, the character's background, and the viewing audience. It shows the diversity of the characters, but lets us follow along if we don't speak that native language. We wish there were more movies that would do this. We think this is respectful. Jessica Chastain's company, Freckle Films, is one of the production companies on this movie. She created this company in part to promote diversity in movies. And this is a very diverse cast, and the use of the native languages and subtitles increases the diversity of this movie without feeling like they were trying to hit us over the head with their diversity. Finally, let's talk about the movie experience itself. We saw the 355 in a Dolby Cinema Theater. This is probably our favorite theater setup right now for watching almost any movie, and it worked very well for the 355. The sound in that theater is excellent, and the seat shaker experience is very subtle. It's just what we like. One item we'd like to address is how to pronounce the movie title. This title is based on a real-world female agent from the American Revolution who had the code name of Agent 355, or Agent 355. 355 was her code name, and it translated to the words, a lady. Although her name was never positively identified, it was assumed she was a lady or a person of higher class in the American colonies. Now, we've read in a few places that this was pronounced 355, not 355. We're not sure which is the right way to say it, but Mace says 355 in the movie, so that's what we used in this episode. So for all of those who want to troll, don't give me grief about it. I was just following what Mace said in the movie. Well, that's a wrap of our quickfire no-spoiler review of the new movie, The 355. It's a movie that we liked. This has been Tom Pizzotto from SpyMovieNavigator.com. Please subscribe to our podcast show and to our YouTube channel, both called Cracking the Code of Spy Movies. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, too. Tell a friend about our show. Thanks for listening. We appreciate it. <laughs>